Jillian Sidoti from crowdfundinglawyers.net. This is our segment, People You Should Know. And today's special guest is Darren Marble from CrowdfundX. Everybody give him a round of applause. Yay! Hi, Hi. Darren. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm so glad that you are in your fancy office with your fancy industrial type looking um, accoutrements and I have my fake plant. So <laughs> winning. <laughs> but tell us, D Darren, what CrowdfundX does. So CrowdfundX is a financial marketing firm and we help clients plan and execute strategic equity crowdfunding campaigns. Um, we're almost exclusively focused on marketing Reg A plus equity crowdfunding campaigns. Prior to getting into this space, we had the experience of marketing over 80 rewards based campaigns on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So it's fair to say we've been in the industry for several years uh, and more recently have really transitioned our focus to Reg A plus marketing. Okay, so you're, are you still doing the Kickstarter campaigns or are you just strictly Reg A now? You know, one in about 10 campaigns we do is a Kickstarter campaign. And generally, because those are exceptions, we don't charge cash fees, but rather we take an ownership position in the business in exchange for services. Oh, how cool is that? So tell me what your favorite Kickstarter campaign is right now. We're doing one right now. It's unbelievable. It's a company called Candwich. It's literally a sandwich in a can, Jillian. Tasty. It's surprisingly <laughs> tasty. The apple turnover is great. Um, and this is kind of a unique product. There's actually a huge value there. It's an MRE. It's great for disaster relief, disaster recovery. Sure. Um, and it's currently funding on Indiegogo. It may be featured on a major national television network in January. Um, we got noticed by a casting director for an upcoming seed series competition. Um, and it, it's kind of, um, I won't say gimmicky, but it is a unique quirky product. And um, we have a 15% ownership stake in that business and didn't charge the client any cash fees. So vested interest to see this campaign succeed. Oh, how fantastic is that? Well, that sounds like it's going to be amazing. Um, but let's talk about the equity side because most of our viewers are looking at the equity side. Um, cool. And so I want to know, what do you see as the latest crowdfunding trends? You know, I think... The, the trend is maybe that there, there is an education happening. And I think um, between you know, June of 2015 and today, we've seen a number of companies take shots on goal, so to speak, meaning a lot of different types of businesses and issuers were attempting to raise capital through Reg A+. The transition we're seeing is that a number of issuers in the council, um, other service providers, are becoming more educated about what types of companies are generally more likely to succeed. And so I think, um, I don't wanna say we're seeing a thinning out of issuers, but we're seeing more qualified issuers come to the table uh, and are generally better positioned for success because they're inherently better fits for Reg A+. Okay, what makes a good fit then? Um, for non-real estate deals, I think the following characteristics make an issuer a good fit. Companies that have operating history, that have already raised $3 million uh, in previous funding. They're doing $2 million or more in annual sales. They have 5,000 or more paying customers, at least 10,000 or more authentic fans, 10 or more employees in the firm. So, you know, the, the, the takeaway is that Reg A Plus is probably not a great fit if you're a pre-product, pre-revenue, if you're a super early stage startup. It's going to be a much better fit, and ultimately, it's going to be um, more attainable for um, not necessarily later stage, but non pre revenue startup companies, companies that have operating history that are selling a product or service and have a customer base. Oh, okay. All right. So, what now you differentiated that from real estate, and how does that differentiate from real estate? Well, you know, we are doing a really interesting um, real estate campaign right now, and I think the main difference is that. Um, you know, real estate companies don't necessarily come to the table or the plate with a fan base, but that doesn't mean that they're not a fit for Reg A+. What generally has to happen from our standpoint to succeed in a Reg A for real estate is the issuer has to make an investment in building a crowd before they run their live offer. And that's the common denominator. You either uh, come to the table with a crowd or you have to build a crowd. And this is not a crowd that you buy through someone's email list or you rent an email list. You have to build what we call an owned and operated email list. And unfortunately, that, that takes time and it costs money to do right. So for the Reg A real estate issuers we're working with, 
they're generally willing to invest substantial marketing dollars and defer the timing of the campaign, maybe they're gonna build an audience for three or six months so that by the time they are qualified by the SEC, they go into a live offer, they have an audience in place, and not only that, this is an audience that has been educated, nurtured, even conditioned for three to six months and is informed and aware of this company, and therefore they're more likely to invest by the time we market the live offer. So that's so interesting that you say that because I think all of the reggae's that our office is doing right now, if I think through them, every single one of them is a real estate offering. And I will only accept those offerings if those real estate entrepreneurs have their own big list that's well developed. And if they've done private placement memorandums prior that were successful. Sure. Because um, they, they, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, well, I tried this, you know, regulation D rule 506 offering and it didn't work. It, that, just switching to reg A because you can take money from unaccredited investors uh, and, and do advertising is not going to, it's not going to make some kind of magic. Um, so I will discourage people from doing a regulation A plus, even though, you know, the costs that we charge for a reg A versus a reg D is, is vastly different. It doesn't do me any good as a lawyer to have unsuccessful reg A campaigns out there. And I can usually identify that they won't be successful if they don't have the fan base like you're talking about. Um, so it's very interesting how you differentiate between a real estate offering and a, another type of offering because although it's true that they don't have any assets or you, the, the reggae itself might not have any assets or history, I for for sure want to make sure that that issuer, that individual or that company has some kind of base and some kind of history. I, I think you're spot on. It's absolutely critical for success and we're in the same position as you. We don't want to take fees from clients that we aren't confident are going to be successful. It's not good for anyone. Um, and I think the bottom line here is that reggae is not a shortcut. It is not a trick. It's actually really challenging and difficult to uh, orchestrate and execute a successful reggae campaign. And so the key is to be, for us, very transparent with prospective issuers about what we think their likelihood of success may or may not be. And if they're determined to move forward, what are the strategies and tactics that we can help them employ to increase their likelihood of success and ultimately mitigate risk. And generally, as to your point, it involves a, a really focused audience building effort. People uh, are, are still learning in this space as a lot have learned in the reward space. It's not as simple as creating a campaign page or a video and pushing the launch button. You have to market to a built-in audience and it's ideal if that audience uh, has you know, some affinity with the issuer they're either a paying customer or they've been receiving communications for months and therefore more likely to convert and become investors. So is that part of what you prepare a client for is, is when they're starting with their attorney and their auditor uh, and getting the paperwork together, do you start the campaign right there and then? What, what's the preparation look like? So in a typical campaign, we're usually planning and ramping up for at least two months and that's followed by two months of marketing the live offer. Mm -hmm. and develop a number of critical assets during what we call the strategic planning phase. So there's the branding and advertising strategy, the audience development strategy, the video, which is the primary sales tool, the art and copy for the campaign page, comprehensive email marketing campaign, press kit, press release, etc. Those assets are, are really involved and require a lot of effort um, from a substantial and qualified group of experts to, to put together. Um, in the real estate example that I mentioned, it's for us, it's actually a six month audience building initiative, very focused. Oh, wow. And it's essentially half of the budget we're being paid is passed through. It's going right back to audience development. We are buying media. Um, you know, a substantial marketing budget, I'll just say north of $100,000 to build that audience. Um, because otherwise, there's no audience to receive that. Um, communication and be likely to invest. So usually it's, it's two months of planning and two months of marketing, but I, I think the, the philosophy we have is that the success or failure of your reg A campaign um, is gonna live or die by how you do the planning. I wanna back up for a second because you just mentioned something that I don't think a lot of um, my clients have been utilizing uh, in a positive manner or just don't really know how to utilize, which is the video. 
Um, what makes a good crowdfunding video? You know, it's an excellent question. And I think this is one of the most overlooked aspects of equity crowdfunding in general. The story is of the utmost importance and oftentimes is, is foundational to the success or failure of a reggae campaign. Mm -hmm. What most issuers fail to realize, Jillian, is that when you're raising capital from the crowd, the average unaccredited person uh, needs to be sold through the story. And that story may not necessarily be about facts and figures. It might be more about ideas and dreams. And therefore, we are determined to tell a story that effectively communicates the issuer's vision, their mission, and values. Those are the three most important aspects that a CEO needs to communicate to his or her audience to inspire people, to engage, to connect, and ultimately to invest. And that's easier said than done. So, you know, when we have a video production budget, let's say uh, our typical reggae video budget's 20000 we spend every last penny. We don't have any margin in the video because that's the last place we want to skimp. Or, or, yeah. or, or try to do for a lower cost. Okay. So our advice is, you know, don't skimp on the video. You need to tell a strong story. The CEO needs to be looking the audience in the eye. And of course, for real estate, it is very financially oriented. Uh, there's a return. Maybe you're beating a, you know, S and P average. But you have to tell a story that emotionally connects uh, and inspires people. And 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 doing that is easier said than done. So what what I heard in that was that the video shouldn't be like this. Hey everyone, can you give me some money? Thank you. Not at all. <laughs> it has to be real. It has to be authentic. It, you know, it, it's going to be challenging for issuers that use a spokesperson or third party to deliver the message. And you know, I think the tendency in these deals is for the issuer to tell kind of a very dry, more institutional story. Right. And this is not a road show. You're not being walked around the country by an investment bank. You have to connect with people on a very emotional and raw level. Um, and so vision, mission, and values. And, and, and the essence of it is people don't care about what you do. They care about why you do it. And that can be especially challenging in real estate where you're buying storage space, commercial buildings, um, you know, strip malls. But you still have to find a way to tell a story about your real estate offering that is going to inspire people. Uh, and so it's just a really important aspect. Uh, Darren, I can't even tell you how that was just such amazing advice that I know my viewers absolutely needed to hear. And I thank you so much. But before I let you go, I need to know two things. One, what books do you recommend for our viewers? So I'm going to take a quick cheat here because um, there is a book I'd like to recommend. And that book is called How to Raise Money, The Ultimate Guide to Crowdfunding. It's written by a colleague and friend, Melinda Moore. Oh, Melinda, yay! She's going to be on this program. That's great. Um, I, I think Melinda is a, is a great example of a female executive leader here in the LA scene. But it's, it's comprehensive and dynamic. That book covers a number of aspects of reggae, plus storytelling, digital marketing, um, talks about the service providers and experts that issuers generally need to be successful. That would be the one book I would recommend for any issuer that is considering raising money through reggae plus. Oh, that's fantastic. Darren, I want to thank you so much. And then if you could please send me your set designer's name, I got to, I got to fire the guy who did this thing here. And, uh, <laughs> <That's hard. laughs> and I will talk to you soon. Everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. And Darren, thank, thank you. you so much for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Bye.